Hi all. Today I will be dealing with Rabi's session and the facts and no fear. So today we will discuss about Rabi's. We know Rabi's belongs to Lysa virus and it produces progressive encephalitis and it is 100% fatal. It affects warm-blooded mammals and rabbit dogs accounts for 99 90% of the case 99% of the cases and bats are now the major source in america the mammals includes dogs cats monkeys horses fox and so on so a uh, few points regarding morphology of rabies virus you can remember by the code bean b stands for bullet as we all know rabies is a virus with unique morphology that is bullet shaped morphology you can see the electron microscopic view here it looks like a bullet and from the bullet you can see some strands outside protruding and they are the antigens they include glycoprotein g that is coming outside the bilipid layer and the other antigens that is responsible for the antigenicity is nucleocapsid so nucleocapsid it has an helical symmetry and compresses of negative sense rna which has a nucleoprotein and there is a rl and rnr and l l and p proteins attached the, to this nucleocapsid so we have the negative stranded single stranded rna the lnp protein that is the rna polymerase and the nucleocapsid protein so all this compresses all this is the nucleocapsid and remember nucleocapsid and the glycoprotein g are the major antigens of rabies so again remember the code bean bullet it is enveloped it has antigens glycoprotein g and nucleocapsid and n stands for nucleocapsid and nucleocapsid it has an helical symmetry and compresses a single stranded negative sense rna nucleoprotein and polymerase proteins the l and the p rna polymerase even though porcupine transmits rabies porcupine quills don't transmit rabies and snakes fish birds crocodile lizard they are not mammals and they don't transmit rabies remember if any scratch or bite by these animals patients come to us you don't give arv or serum so rabies virus we have the street viruses and the fixed viruses these two names you should be very thorough because street viruses they are the freshly prepared strains from the laboratory and they mimic wild viruses and produce inclusion bodies and it can show a long and variable incubation incubation period whereas fixed virus we propagate these street viruses these are the street viruses that we propagate into the rabies by serial brain to brain passage and they lose certain properties and remember they don't produce inclusion bodies they don't multiply in external tissues they don't infect salivary glands and they multiply rapidly in 3 to 4 days and remember these fixed viruses are best used for vaccination so we will discuss about the pathogenesis of rabies virus rabies viruses how is it how is it transmitted rabies virus is usually transmitted to humans by bites and 99% of the cases is by the rabbit dogs it can be either by a deep bite or a scratch from an infected animal with rabies and again other animals is also involved in transmitting rabies like the bats which is a major source in america and there are other warm blooded mammals also that I have just listed earlier it need not always be bites it can be non bite exposures like direct contact with the saliva of the, of the infected animal with the mucosa or the fresh skin wounds in the humans and laboratory workers second case is the laboratory workers who is working in a virus containing aerosols are also again a risk for transmission and the third one is the cornea or other organ transplantation again is high chance for 
exposure of rabies. So certain contacts is not at all reported to transmit rabies that we should keep in mind like human to human transmission through bites or saliva. Even though theoretically it is possible, we have never come across such a case. Again, certain certain patients come and ask whether uh, they have consumed raw milk or raw meat or milk of infected animals. Uh, does uh, that is, is there any risk for transmission of rabies virus? Actually, there is no risk of transmission there. There is no risk while if you consume a raw meat or a milk of infected animals. So, again, bites from rodents. Again, uh, the rodent bites is you need not give any ARV. And petting of a rabid animal or a contact with the blood, urine or feces of a rabid animal. Again, there is no risk of transmission of rabies. Because there is no viremia here actually. Here there is no viremia. Hence the blood, uh, there is no, if you come in contact with the blood, there is no chance of transmission. So these points you should keep in mind. And we will just discuss. And again, uh, and again we have, dis uh, now we will discuss about the spread of the virus. How is it causing the disease? So what is happening? There is viral inoculation from a rapid dog bite. Isn't it? So, and the virus is inoculated into the site either into the muscle or the connective tissue. So that is the first step. There is multiplication locally there. And second step is the, as you can see, the viral virus is inoculated here and there is the entry of the virus into the peripheral neurons. And here comes our major antigen of the viruses that we have discussed earlier. That is the glycoprotein G. So as I told you, there are two major antigens of the rabies virus, glycoprotein G and the nucleocapsid. And for the pathogenesis, we need glycoprotein G. And these viruses, with the help of glycoprotein G, it helps to bind the virus into the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And from there, there is neuronal spread. That is the centripetal spread along the peripheral motor nerves into the dorsal root ganglion. And it is said that the axonal, fast axonal transport the, far, the rate is approximately 25 centimeters per day. And from the dorsal root ganglion of the spinal cord, it ascends upwards towards the central nervous system to reach the CNS. From the CNS, it replicates and again it is disseminated to the other all sides of the central nervous system, especially the hippocampus and the cerebellum. From the brain, it has a centrifugal spread. The virus spreads along the sensory and autonomic nerves to the various tissues. That is the salivary glands. It goes to the salivary glands. It goes to skin. It goes to cornea. And it goes to other organs like the pancreas, kidney, heart, retina and the cornea. And that's why corneal transplantation is having risk of rabies transmission. Other organ transplantation is also having risk of rabies. So, Remember, viremia does not occur here. That is why if you have come in contact with blood, there is no risk of virus transmission. And shedding of uh, saliva, shedding of rabies in the saliva is possible, in uh, theoretically possible, but human to human transmission is actually not documented. And what is the pathological thing that you can see in the rabies virus in the brain? It is the negri bodies. Actually, negri bodies are the intracytoplasmic isnophilic inclusion. So whenever you hear of negri bodies, think that it is a intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusions that is present inside the brain parenchyma and whenever you see an agri bodies in the brain parenchyma it is the most important pathological finding of the rabies so coming to the clinical manifestation manifestations first thing is the incubation period actually rabies virus the incubation period is very prolonged and variable and average range is approximately 20 to 100 days and can range from either one week to 19 years so it's very important you cannot say a clear cut that this patient can have this much uh, develop will develop clinical symptoms with within this much time because it's a wide range of period one week to 19 years so whoever come for vaccination should be given at the earliest and the it depends upon the it depends upon certain factors and it has a direct relation to the distance for the virus to travel from the site of inoculation to the CNS. If it is shorter, it is having a high, um, it is more riskier because there is the incubation period will be shorter and uh, it's very, very important 
to know the site of bite and children as the distance of traveling to the cns will be very low so the ch children are affected more than the adults any bites on the head neck upper limbs short pupils several lacerations again there is high chance of getting more viruses inoculated into the nerves certain genetic predispositions is also been described low host immunity is very important the high dose of inoculum is very important and increased virulence of the strains again can produce a very short incubation period so the clinical spectrum of rabies viruses is rabies disease is divided into three phases the prodromal phase acute neurological phase coma and death the prodromal phase it lasts for 2 to 10 days and it's characterized by non specific symptoms such as fever malaise anorexia nausea vomiting photophobia sore throat and abnormal sensations around the wound site acute neurological phase we have two stages two either uh, that it follows either of the two type like encephalitic type or a paralytic type 80% of the patients go for encephalitic or furious rabies it is 80 percentage 20 percentage cases presents with paralytic or dumb bear rabies so what is happening in encephalitic or furious rabies it lasts for 2 to 7 days and we have the hyper excitability that is the earliest symptoms like the patient will have anxiety agitation hyperactivity bizarre behavior and hallucination after this stage that is the hyper excitability stage the patient go for lucid interval where it is followed by complete lucidity and there you can have like after the lucid interval you can have the autonomic dysfunction and the hydrophobia the typical hydrophobia or aerophobia aerophobia in the autonomic dysfunctions there is increased lacrimation salivation due to which leads to foaming of foaming at the mouth increased perspiration goose flesh cardiac arrhythmias and priapism so what is producing the fear of what we think of hydro what we think is the patient will have fear of water or fear of air but the fact is it is because of the involuntary painful spasm of the respiratory laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles it is because probably because of the dysfunction of the infected brain stem neurons so this is how an encephalitic or furious rabies presents 80% of the patients presents like this that is a encephalitic or furious rabies and what is happening in paralytic or dumb rabies this occurs only in 20% of the cases it is characterized by flaccid paralysis you will get cordy paralysis first the paralysis occurs in the bitten limb so very important history is very important because the bitten limb gets paralyzed earlier and it ascends and it progresses to cordy paralysis with facial paralysis also remember hydrophobia and other features of encephalitic rabies is not present in paralytic rabies and all these patients can progress to coma and death the patients with paralytic rabies can survive longer like up to 31 month whereas if it is a neurologic presentation or encephalitic presentation it, patients just go for approximately 22 weeks anyway death is almost certain and recovery and survival are extremely rare so what are the laboratory diagnosis methods that you do to diagnose rabies first one is the rabies antigen detection you can detect the antibody you can isolate virus go for viral rna detection or negribody detection the most important test to diagnose rabies is the rabies antigen detection that too the direct immunofluorescence test it detects the nucleoprotein antigens that i have told earlier we know that we have two major antigens the glycoprotein g and the nucleoprotein antigen glycoprotein g helps you to attach to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors whereas nucleoprotein antigens helps you to detect whether you have rabies in the body so 
the direct immunofluorescence test is performed to detect the nucleoprotein antigen. How is it performed? Here you use a specific monoclonal antibodies packed with fluorescent dye to detect these proteins. And this is the DFA test. And remember, this is the gold standard test for detecting rabies. And where do you take the specimen? You take the specimen from the hair follicles of nape of neck. Very, very important question. In many exam, many entrance exams has asked this question. From where do you take sample for detecting antigens for rabies? It is not the cornea. It is the first best, 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 the best specimen is hair follicle of the nape of neck. And corneal smear, you can also take corneal impression smear, but it is usually positive only in the late stage and with 30% sensitivity. So next, next test is viral isolation by mouse inoculation or by the cell lines. And cell lines isolation is the preferred method. It's nowadays not used. Next is the antibody detection. We detect the CSF antibodies, which is more significant than the serum antibodies because serum antibodies appear late and can also be present after vaccination. CSF antibodies, you don't see there in response to if, even if the patient is vaccinated, you don't see CSF antibodies. So CSF antibodies appear earlier and they are produced only in rabies infected individuals and does not, is not seen in response to vaccination. And there are several formats that is available to detect the antibodies by employing antigens such as glycoprotein or nucleoprotein. The mouse neutralization test, MNT, rapid fluorescent focus inhibition test, fluorescent antibody virus neutralization test, indirect fluorescent assay. So most sensitive test is the RT-PCR test. It is taken from the sample taken from brain tissue, cornea or the skin. Here you detect, you amplify the genes of the rabies virus, genes coding for nucleoprotein or the structural protein. And again, it is the most sensitive test present for the diagnosis of rabies now. So the last test is an agribody detection. Here it is, this is done to confirm postmortem diagnosis. As you know, it is an inclusion body. It is an intracytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion, which is seen mainly in the cerebellum and the hippocampus, the pyramidal neurons of the hippocampus, the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. You can do histological staining with the H and E or the cellular stains. And immunohistochemical immuno staining can also be done by peroxidase in the formalin fixed tissues. And immunohistochemistry is the more sensitive and specific than the histological staining methods. Remember, negri body detection is pathognomonic of rabies, but 20 percentage cases you need not detect negri bodies. But remember, the absence of negri bodies does not rule out the diagnosis of rabies. So how do you treat rabies? So you diagnose rabies. So how, do you going, how, how are you going to treat? There is no specific treatment for rabies. So if you have diagnosed rabies, remember 100% mortality. It's only symptomatic treatment is there and this treatment can only prolong life. But the outcome is almost always fatal. You can isolate the patient, you can hydrate, you can help urination, give sedatives, anti-anxiety measures, but all of this, even though you give all these things, mortality is 100%. And however, it is a preventable by administration of post-exposure therapy during the early incubation period. And we have well-documented cases who survived from rabies only because of vaccination. So prevention is better than cure, far, far better than cure. And remember, 100% mortality, you cannot treat the patient, you patient you cannot, you can only give symptomatic treatment. So better prevent yourself by taking vaccines and immunoglobulins. So as I said, rabies is prevented by providing prophylactic measures. You give post-exposure prophylaxis after exposure and before exposure 
you can give pre-exposure profile access. So this can prevent you from rabies. First, we will discuss about the post-exposure profile access. Remember, post-exposure profile access has three components. You have the local wound care, you have rabies vaccine, rabies immunoglobulin. So, and what treatment you give depends upon the categorization. So, this is how WHO has classified the wound. So, the exposure, the exposure they classify it as category 1, category 2 and category 3. Category 1 it is having no risk, category 2 having minor risk and category 3 major risk. So what are these categories? We will discuss now. You can see the slide. Touching or feeding of an animal licks on intact skin are only considered as category 1 and there is no treatment needed if the history is reliable. And minor that is the category 2. Here you have minor scratches or abrasions. There is no bleeding there. There is only scratches you can see. And if you are nibbling of an uncovered skin, it is considered as a category 2. And you give rabies vaccine. And you observe the dog for 10 days and you won't manage the wound. Again, category 3 means it is a single or multiple transdermal bites. With oozing of the blood, you need oozing of blood. And licks on the broken skin. If it is a broken skin, fresh wounds or mucous membrane, it is considered as a category 3. And remember, direct contact with bats or wild animals is considered as category 3. Here, the difference is that you give vaccine and immunoglobulin along with the wound, man along, uh, with the wound management. You give both vaccine and rabies immunoglobulin here. So, you can here you can see the category 2 wound, nibbling of uncovered skin, minor scratches or abrasion. Here, you need to give only wound management and the anti rabies vaccine so you can see the category 3 bites where you can see the transdermal multiple transdermal bites lacerated wounds all these belongs to the category 3 bites so again category 3 bites licks on the broken skin also can be considered as category 3 bites even mucosa mucous membrane licks on the mucous membrane is considered as category 3 bite and remember even though Remember, direct contact with the bats or wild animals is considered as category 3 bites. So again, as I told, by bite by wild animals is considered as category 3. All bite in forest area is considered as category 3. Remember, if you have an immunocompromised patients like malignant patient, patient cancer patients, taking immunosuppressive drugs, even though it is category 2, they are category 2 exposure, they are treated as category 3 patients. So, category 3 includes bite by wild animals, all bite in forest area, category 2 exposure in immunocompromised and other points that I have highlighted like single or multiple transdermal bites with oozing of blood, licks on broken skin or mucous membrane. All these are considered as category 3 exposure. So, coming to the local wound care. Actually, whenever you come across patient with rabbit dog bite, you immediately wash the wound with soap and water at least for 15 minutes. And after washing, you dis disinfect the wound with povidone iodine or alcohol so that you can inactivate the residual virus. If you have local tissue damage, you don't go for suturing as, as it can spread the virus. So, Whenever there is deeper wounds and if you require suturing, you go for loose suturing only after you infiltrate the immunoglobulin into the wound. Go for TT prophylaxis, antibiotic treatment to prevent bacterial, secondary bacterial infections. And remember that you should not touch your hand with bare hand. So never touch your wound with bare hand. And don't try to apply any sort of irritants like soil, lime and herbs. So coming to the history of rabies vaccine, virtually all infections with rabies result in, resulted in death until two French scientists, Louis Pasteur and Emil Rox, developed the first rabies vaccination in 1885. A nine-year-old Joseph Mister, 
who had been mauled by a rabbit dog was the first human to receive this vaccine here you can see the picture of the boy being vaccinated by louis pasteur the treatment was started as a subcutaneous injection on 6th july 1885 which was a historical milestone in the history of rabies coming to rabies vaccines previously there were neural vaccines which were derived from brain of infected animals such as sample vaccines bpl vaccines suckling mouse brain vaccines these are no longer used nowadays because of the potential to produce encephalitis since there is encephalitogenic potential nowadays these are not at all used and we have the second generation ARVs that is the anti rabies vaccines one is the purified duck embryo vaccine and the recombinant non neural vaccines and after this came the cell line derived vaccines these are the newer cell line derived non neural vaccines which are recommended to give to the patients there are three cell line derived non neural vaccines one purified chick embryo cell vaccines which is prepared from the chicken fibroblast cell line that is the pcec you can see it is a rabi pure and other one is a purified vero cell vaccine which is prepared from the vero cell line you can see the abirab and the vero rab and rabi vax all these are the vero cell line vaccines the gold standard vaccine is the human diploid cell vaccine which is derived from the wi13 human embryonic lung fibroblast cell line this is having less side effects and uh, nowadays much preferred vaccine that is a human diploid cell vaccine so how is the rabies vaccine administered you can administer either by the intradermal or the intramuscular route so you have the updated thai regimen or you have the essence regimen and the preferred site of administration is usually deltoid area of the arm for adults and the anterolateral area of the thigh for children so deltoid for adults and anterolateral area for the children and you should never administer the rabies vaccine in the gluteal area and if you are giving it as an intradermal dose you give it as 0.1 ml dose and if it is an uh, im dose you give the entire vial of the vaccine irrespective of the vial size so that is a very important point so for intradermal dose you give 0.1 ml for the im dose you give full entire dose of the vial irrespective of the vial size coming to the updated thai regimen what is updated thai regimen updated thai regimen is the intradermal regimen where you use two site intradermal vaccine and this dose is given on day 0 day 3 day 7 and day 28 so you have four doses you give on two deltoids 0.1 ml each to 2202 why you are saying zero because in the intramuscular injection schedule it, there is a day 14 that is included so intramuscular dose there is five doses updated thai regimen that is the intradermal dose it's only four doses that is seen so again you can see here 22202 on day 0 day 3 day 7 and day 28 so if you are giving verorab Verorab actually you can you can give both IM as well as intradermal. So if you are using uh, verorab, you can give full vial. That is, it is a 0.5 ml vial. You give the entire vial. Whereas if you are going for an intradermal dose, you give only 0.1 ml, whatever the vial size. So if it is 0.5 ml for verorab, you give only one fifth of the vial. That is the intradermal dose. If it is rabi pure or rab but about it is a 1 ml per vial so you give the entire 1 ml im and whereas if you if you are planning to give intradermally you give only 0.1 ml of this 1 ml so it becomes 1/10th of the vial so this is a very important point remember for intramuscular administration you give the entire vial irrespective of the vial size 
whereas intradermally if you are giving you give only 0.1 ml of the vaccine here you can see the sn schedule that is the intramuscular post exposure prophylaxis intramuscular regimen so what is here there is day 14 that is included so you have 1 1 1 1 1 five doses are there and here here you, you need not give in two sites you give only single site administration so you write it as 1 1 1 1 1 and you give the entire dose of the vaccine and why is intradermal dose preferred and many uh, we have the intradermal doses being promoted by because it is cost effective any government can run a vaccine administration with this intradermal dose because only one fifth or the one tenth dose will be used so it is cost effective and dose sparing and time sparing and therefore they are preferred over the intramuscular regime and another theory is that we have a lot of dendritic cells in the intradermal area which also boosts our boosts our immunity we will just brush up our idea regarding the post exposure prophylaxis as we told sn regimen 1 1 1 1 1 on day 0, 3, 7, 14, 28, total 5 dose. Updated thai, only 4 dose. You don't have a 14th day dose. 2, 2, 2, 2 0, 2. 0, 3, 7, 28. There is no day 14 on thai. And it is a 2 site injection. That is the updated thai. Whereas intramuscular it is a single site. And you can, if you are giving on 0, 7, 21 and 28, it is a pre-exposure prophylaxis. Pre-exposure prophylaxis is given in uh, individuals of higher occupational risk who works in the remote endemic areas. There you repeat the same dose, the SN or the updated thai, but on a different period. Which period? On day 0, day 7, 21 or 28, you give three doses. Two site injection for intradermal, one site for intramuscular. And what if the patient is already vaccinated if already vaccinated if the if there is a repeat exposure occurs within three months of receiving the post uh, uh, post exposure prophylaxis you need to give only local wound management neither vaccine nor rig is needed are needed so if it is more than three months you need to give two doses of vaccine one in the day zero or day three but the difference is that you need to give only single site even im or i intradermal it is only single site intradermal single site intramuscular on day zero and day three so less than three months no need of vaccine more than three months of repeat exposure in a previously ex vaccinated individual two doses single site intradermal or intramuscular day zero or day three and day three and uh, sometimes a patient on intradermal route, uh, given already two doses completed intramuscularly, says that hey, I, I want to get vaccines from government hospital where you have the intradermal uh, vaccine. So in such uh, situation, you can give uh, repeat. You can you need not to resume. You need not um, restart it. You can resume the PEP course. And actually, if they can, they. Um, if, if they can continue the same intramuscular route, it is better. But if due to unavoidable circumstances, they need to change, the, the, it is acceptable. And you need to ensure the PEP course completion only. And uh, just check the vial whether it is given intramuscularly only or intradermally only. It is uh, written in the uh, vaccine vial and do accordingly. And uh, if there is a dose, uh, vaccine dose that is delayed for any reason and the and the patient comes later uh, and within a period of 10 days you, you uh, just resume the pp regimen and you need not restart it that is the very much very uh, important point so um, there are a lot of cases uh, patients come with a lot of uh, uh, doubts like uh, sir i have missed one dose what should i do uh, one or two days deviation you don't necessarily restart the schedule you can just resume the schedule because the important point is that first three doses should be given within 10 days it is very important you can plan accordingly 
so 037 dose is very important and and that should be given within the 10 days so any patient have for example if the patient have missed third dose and he have he came on fifth day you can give the second dose on the fifth day and the day seven dose on the day seven itself so uh, likewise you can plan that so the, just remember this sentence first three doses should be given within 10 days one or two days deviation you don't necessarily it is you need not restart the schedule if one or more of the first dose missed administer additional dose to complete vaccination and this is how you follow and remember intramuscular and which candidates usually in the government hospitals you have the intradermal route that is preferred but there are certain situations where you give intramuscular route what are they which are the clinical scenarios one remember one long term patient on long term steroids high dose steroids patient on immunosuppression treatment for cancer aids patients patient taking hcqs for malaria or for the rheumatological disease in such patients you need to give intramuscular regimen very very important point so as i already told intramuscular rabies vaccine is given in patients who is taking long term steroids immunosuppressed patients hiv cancer and patients taking hcq so a drug history is important their um, whether whether the uh, HIV status is important, patient uh, immunocomb suppressed state is important, uh, cancer patients, uh, all this history should be uh, kept in mind, and you should ask for this. Uh, so you can uh, prescribe a MRV. And um, as I said, uh, you can assess the uh, coming to the pre-exposure prophylaxis. How do you assess your immunity? It is very important because you go for booster in high risk group because you need to check your antibody titer every six months and after two years or and after two years you check every two hour two yearly and if the antibody is less than 0.5 international units per ml you go for a booster dose this is very very important and some patients come can come with allergy of the intradermal rabies vaccine in such patients you just check whether what is the vaccine sometimes it can be an egg embryo egg, egg vaccine or it can be a chick embryo vaccine in such patients you go for you change the brand you change the cell lines you go for human deployed vaccines another points that i have to discuss i would like to discuss is regarding saliva splash if sometimes you get a splash over your eyes you treat it as category 3 actually because you treat you wash thoroughly wash the area you uh, go for arv and you can uh, rather than injecting you cannot inject isn't it in the conjunctiva what will you do you try to rinse that area with the immunoglobulin and this will prevent developing rabies lot of patients come to your casualty with lot of queries Sometimes they say, ask whether, sir, whether we need to give uh, post-exposure prophylaxis because our animal is vaccinated and it is not provoked by it. It is a, uh, it is not a, it is provoked by it, uh, whether we need to give vaccine or not. Remember, post-exposure prophylaxis should be given irrespective of the vaccination status of the animal, whether provoked or unprovoked. So, vaccination should be given irrespective of the vaccination status of the animal, provoked or an unprovoked bite you need not bother about that and uh, some patients may ask well, sir is there any contraindication for vaccination for post exposure prophylaxis remember there is no contraindication for vaccination arv and uh, sometimes many uh, many patients uh, may come after a months or years so as we all know the incubation period is very prolonged and variable so even after years or months after exposure it is said that you should give anti rabies vaccine sometimes the patient may ask you whether uh, have uh, taken uh, meat which is bitten by a rabbit dog or i suspect rabies in that patients in that animal so what should you do whether you should give uh, vaccine or not you should give vaccine if it is a if you have consumed a uncooked meat if it is a cooked meat you need not worry about it and you need not get a vaccine and remember uh, you should get your uh, 
rig that is the rabies immunoglobulin within seven days of the first dose of idrv or imrv so that is a very important point that you should keep in mind because if the patient come on day zero and they have confusion regarding a rig and if they are come or if they are coming after 10 days after bite then also there is no use so if you should give rig within the first dose of idrv first dose of idrv is on the day three day zero isn't it so within seven days you should give rig that is the recommended schedule and um, what about the storage and use remember idrv or imrv is stored at about two to eight degree celsius and once reconstituted it should be used within six hours earlier erig or hrig uh, was to uh, was to be was give, uh, given uh, half half that is one uh, half the dose will be in the intramuscular side and half the dose will be in the uh, uh, the bitten side but now the whole uh, erig is now given in the wound side and it is very very important these are the important queries uh, of layman and uh, even doctors many doctors don't know this and uh, you should be uh, you should know all these points and so that you could uh, solve their queries. So again by intramuscular, intradermal or intramuscular regimen, cost effectiveness, dose sparing, rich in dendritic cells affected in intradermal roots and it is time sparing. And you give 1 ml insulin syringe, you take in 1 ml insulin syringe, draw 0.2 ml of the vaccine needed for one patient that is 0.1 ml per intradermal site for two sites stretch the skin surface insert the tip of the needle with bevel upwards remember the bevel should be upwards slowly inject half that is 0.1 ml that is 10 units uppermost dermal layer of the skin over the deltoid area an inch above the insertion of the deltoid muscle if the needle is correctly placed inside the dermis the resistance is felt while injecting Raised blood should begin to appear immediately, causing a pseudo-orange appearance. Remaining volume of the vaccine on the opposite deltoid area. So if you inject subcutaneously, the vaccine is injected subcutaneously, uh, you don't see any PUD orange. So then what do you do? You withdraw the needle and reinsert at an adjacent site and intradermal vaccine given once more. So, as I said, the alternate site other than the deltoid region is the anterolateral thigh and the sup or the suprascapular area. So, coming to the rabies immunoglobulin, this is given in category 3 patients and category 2 with immunocompromised patients. So, here you give HRIG. ERIG and the dosage is 20 units per kg for HRIG which requires only a smaller amount and ERIG you need to give 40 units per kg and the entire dose is administered in the wound itself. Previously we used to give half dose intramuscularly and half dose at the site. Now entire dose you give in the wound site itself. The important point is that rabies immunoglobulin should be given within 7 days after intramuscular or intradermal rabies vaccine preferably within 24 hours so preferably you should give within 24 hours you need not delay the rabies immunoglobulin to keep and it should keep the temperature between 25 to 30 degree celsius before administering and is there any reaction chance for erig the chance is 1 in 1.5 lakhs and sometimes you can get serum sickness after seven days after administration. So any patients who come with fever, joint pain, rash after seven days of ERIG, think of the possibility of serum sickness. Observe the patients for 20 minutes. No need of admission after ERIG. So this is a very, very important point. So how do you infiltrate? How do you infiltrate RIG? This you should know. So, infiltration is as much as possible into the depth of the wound. That is more important. And 
previously i told it is half is intramuscularly but it is not recommended and rig must never be given intravenously and you remember the important point is that multiple needle pricks should be avoided only a few entry points should be kept because otherwise you will uh, produce more and more viruses into the sites so in multiple bites you calculate the dose of the rabies immunoglobulin and you infiltrate all the wounds you dilute the calculated volume of rig in sterile normal saline to a volume of sufficient to infiltrate all the wounds and remember the total recommended dose of rig must not be excited exceeded as it may suppress the antibody production simultaneously simulated by the anti rabies vaccine so the immunoglobulin should not be more than the recommended dose that you should keep in mind so do you need to have a skin test before rig there is no rationally if anaphylaxis occurs you can give adrenaline hydrocortisone and uh, uh, avil injections you can give so again rig in india you give category 3 immunocompromised patients both category 3 and category 2 and it is a single dose actually within 7 days and usually uh, while injecting into the um bitten site you can either you give it as a static injection in the small superficial wound or you can you can go for as a continuous movement rotating angle through a one puncture whereas in the deep wound you need to give into the base of the wound so deep wound you should infiltrate into the base and a successful wound infiltration you will get oozing so when you get minimum number of puncture it is a good method if you make more puncture you pass this viruses more viruses are passed so it is not a good method this is very much very very important so few points regarding monoclonal antibody this is a newer antibody that has developed it is a safe reliable source of anti rabies antibody than comparative blood derived immunoglobulins it is recommended as a passive antibody for post exposure prophylaxis of rabies the reaction chance is very very low and it is a uh, it is derived by using our dna recombinant dna technology and the dose is 3.33 international units per kg so after my session i think you will be able to solve all these queries can you give immunoglobulin after 9 days no it should be given preferably within 7 days preferably 24 hours so can i take intramuscular after intradermal dose yes if unavoidable to complete course so i think you all have understood my class uh, thank you thank you for your patient listening do subscribe my channel thank you thank you all